back and how they yield more. So you mentioned the question of yield. And this is an interesting thing. I mean, there are people who will dedicate their entire life, I mean, their technical life, to uh, this understanding of the process and yield issues and reliability and all the you know, those things. But the interesting thing is that the simplest model that explains most of the behavior in the integrated circuit is that when you start with the wafer, so let's say, say nowadays we're talking about 100 centimeter, 100 uh, millimeter uh, uh, radius, or you know, you're talking about 12 inch, 200. Um, so now what you have is that the, most of the defects are point defects. So you can think about it in the process of how things happen. If the, if the part that, that's involving lithography and everything is going well, the problems, there are these problem spots. And these are mostly where the structure of the silicon crystal is actually defective. defective. And uh, so you have a problem with these points. Now let's imagine that you have these points. Now, let's say this is an 8 inch wafer. Uh, I have one upstairs in my office. Oh, the wafer? Yeah. yeah. Ask Michelle to open the door. It's on, you know what it is on my bookshelf to the right? Uh -huh. Yeah. When you enter, it's on your right hand. But, um, so when you have this wafer, right, and you have this point defects. Now, let's say, if I ask you what is the yield. So these are the points where if you had a transistor at these points, there would be a problem. So this is the first order model. That transistor will, will not work properly. And all it takes for a chip not to work properly is one transistor, right? If you have a microprocessor with 200 million transistors, if one of them doesn't work, that's an effective microprocessor. Unless you have some built-in redundancy, which people have worked on things, so you can actually live with one or two errors. But let's say you don't have that. You have, even one of the transistors is defective, that chip is defective. So now, if I ask you what is the yield, can you tell me, based on just this? Right, you need to know the die size. So it's a strong function of how big the die is. So let's say I am making a very small amplifier, which is about, it's, it's, I mean, this is relatively large actually for just a second. Let's say a simple op amp, and this is, again, relatively large. So it's one millimeter squared, so it's one millimeter by one millimeter, and that's considered large. But it's like we said that this is about eight inches, which is about, what? Uh, the eight inches diameter, four inches, so that's about 100, 100 millimeters. So the radius, is 100 millimeters. So, if I tell you I have, um, well, let's see how many I have. So, like, okay. let's say I have 15 of these defective points for the sake of argument. How do we determine the yield? Well, we have to assume that we have covered, we've tiled this wafer with this chip, right? And that's, that's the only chip we're making. So, we are making it, we have kind of a grid of 1 millimeter, right? And so on and so forth. And let's say we have 100. Now, what you have in this case is that how many how many chips do I have, approximately, on this way? One millimeter, one millimeter. Yeah. 30, so you have yeah thirty thousand, right? Because you have to calculate the rate, the, the area, which is about pi times the square, which is thirty thousand millimeter squared, and for one millimeter squared, so that's about thirty thousand chips. So I have thirty thousand chips, and I said if, if the probability of one of these points falling within one of them is pretty small, so only 15 of them would be effective, right? So in that case, my yield, I mean, very approximately, is 15 over 30,000, which is 1 over 2,000, which is what? Which is 0 0.05, well, okay, well, that's the rate of error, so that's, uh, so the rate of failure is 0.05%, right? And that would correspond to a 99.95% yield. That's a darn good, darn good yield, right? Now, let's start with something else. Let's try, so that was, let's say an op -ed. Now, let's say the same process, I'm making a microprocessor. It's about 2 centimeters by 2 centimeters. There are microprocessors on that side. This is an 8-inch wafer. And you can take a look at it. This one actually has a lot of different kind of designs on it. So there are actually six different big sites on this. I think each one of them is about one centimeter by two centimeters by one and a half. The capacitor I'm to take a look at. It. You will identify six different structures. And they're big structures. 
So instead of having one, there's there six on this one. But in general, in production, you have only one. So let's, let's talk about something that's about two, 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters. So the total area is obviously, what? 400 millimeters squared. So for that, how many chips do I get? Well, I get N is 30,000 divided by 400. Let's just, let's just for the sake of argument, make our calculation easy. Let's say it's approximately 300. Right? Let's make this 300. So I get about 100 chips. And how about my yield? So I get 15 out of the 100 broken. So that corresponds to a yield of 85%. For the same number. So I, 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 of course, it's 15, the number, it's number 15 is completely arbitrary. So that's for, those are for the defects in the, in the actual wafer. When you start with, you can't make it perfectly uh, uniform, so you have this defective point. So, but now, this is a very simplistic calculation. What if the defective point falls into an area which I don't, in which I don't have a transistor? Then nothing bad happens, right? So you can actually do a more accurate calculation. And that depends on what the density of the transistors and active devices on your chip is. Certain kind of chips, like the uh, RF chips or microwave chips, have a smaller number of transistors and a lot of passive devices that are made out of metal structures on top. In those, you get a higher yield for the same area, because the actual number of transistors is lower, or the density is lower. And in microprocessors, you have, or memory, you have very high density. So you're more prone to that kind of thing. And now, this, all of this calculation is also just for the defects in the base, I mean, in the substrate, right? In the, in the wafer. Now, if your process has a problem, I'm assuming that everything else goes well. All, everything is, all the masks are perfectly aligned when things happen. All the processing steps are done exactly right. You have no other sources of contamination. You don't run it too long or too short, and all sorts of things. But now, anything like that that adds to it comes, comes, comes substantially <coughs> delicious, right? For instance, let me give you a very simple example. If I mess up one of my lithography steps and I, I'm off in my alignment by 0.1 micron, everything is completely gone. My yield is zero. Right? So it's not that, oh, okay, well, if my chip is small, my yield is necessarily hot. But that's assuming that the foundry does its job properly. Still, you have this kind of very simplest model. There are much more uh, sophisticated and act more accurate models. But this, the, the point to take away from all of this is that it depends on the size of the chip and the number of transistors. But nowadays, even for very large chips, you get very good yields. So for microprocessors, and by the way, the yield information is one of the tightly kept secrets of the foundries. If you want to kind of see an interesting reaction, if you can run into somebody who runs a power reactor, what is your yield on this problem? Do we get an interesting reaction? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on you, uh, who you talk. But the yield is one of the kind of the most uh, supposedly one of the best kept secrets. Is it because basically you can deduce what kind of technology they use out of it? No, because it gives the it, it well. More so, it's an economics, it has something to do with the economy. It's an economics of it. It basically tells, them, tells you what the profit margins are. Let's think about it. I mean, that's, that's one of the things I want to talk about next, the economics of this thing. The profit margins are determined by how much this whole thing costs to make, and how many of these you sell, and how much you sell them for. Now, that is a strong function of this number. Because if now this number goes from here to there, for instance, my profit margins can go from 60, 50% to you know, 30%, 40%. And that has a great impact on the value of the stock eventually. Because I might, if I'm a public company, on my next uh, quarterly report, I have to report exactly how much money I made. How I made it. And when I do that, the Wall Street will not be very happy if I make less money than they expected. So. Now, yes? At a certain point, aren't you coming against some type of limiting factors when you reduce your size in terms of like bridges 
kinds of size reductions, right? I mean, I think that, well, one is the size of the dimensions of the actual devices, right? The minimum size, feature size you can make, how small you can make your transistors. And we saw that that's a good thing because it makes the transistors faster and all those things, but there are, of course, challenges. Many, many, many challenges. And the more, the smaller you want to make them, the harder it gets. Um, that, what you point out is absolutely true about that. But what I'm talking about here is a different kind of scale. I'm talking about the size of the entire chip in a given process. So I, I am given a process, let's say I'm starting with a 0.13 130, uh, micro, 130 nanometer process. That's basically the minimum channel length I can have in that process, let's say, or 90 nanometer process. For that, I have a certain number of, you know, a, a, my design may contain a certain number of transistors. Now, if, that, if I make an amplifier, that design may contain 100 to 100 transistors, right? If I'm making a microprocessor, that may be 100 million transistors. And that's what I was talking about. But you're right. We have that problem as feature sizes and dimensions become smaller and smaller. But did I ask you a question? Oh. Okay, any more questions about this? Yes? Actually, I was just wondering if the defects in the, the wafer had some sort of like distribution that they determined, like if there are certain regions that were much more likely to have defects which are just engineered around. Oh, okay, that's a very good question. Uh, not as much in the base on processed this, uh, wafer, but the way the processing is done, in fact, affects things. And things in the center of the wafer are different from the things on the, on the perimeter of the structure. So in fact, if you want to have equal, let's say if you draw equi-property lines of the transistors, right? There are these kind of lines. And if you look at transistors on this, these lines, more or less they have the same kind of problem. But if you start from the center and get closer to the periphery, what happens is that you will see that the behavior of the transistors change. But the good news is that no, even for the largest of the chips, it's a small change. And we'll talk how this gradient of behavior affects the matching properties of the transistors later on when we talk about matching of balance stages and how you can combat it, basically, how you can defeat this pro problem by knowing that and understanding how to lay out the transistors and what kind of layout will allow you to make a transistor in such a way that the first quarter, no matter where it is, or make two transistors, that no matter where they are, they match well. I mean, I can tell you the answer right now. I don't want to keep it a secret. So if I have two transistors here and there, right, it's very likely for them to have a variation. But if these two, for, how about these two transistors? Those are better because they're closer to each other. But I can't, I, if I'm repeating the same design, I can't make my design deal with that, like that, uh, do behave like that. But what I can do, I can make four transistors and put these two in series, in parallel, and these two in parallel. Now what happens is that anywhere I am, let's say I'm here, right? This transistor and that transistor are moving, have the largest difference, but they are connected in parallel. So they kind of average out to a value which is equal parallel of these two, the first order. That's called the common centroid layout. And we'll talk about that in more detail. So let's give you a preview of that. And this is the first order common centroid. You can make a second order common centroid that cancels the second derivative and things of that sort. But it's uh, important to understand this great. But now, there's one more thing I want to talk about the economics of this thing, even more important than the yield. Understanding how integrated circuits allow to make money and what drives the Moore's law. Right? It's again economics, it's not technology. You have to understand this. The bottom line is that whenever you want to, let's, let's talk about this. Let's say you want to go and make a, set, have a certain project. So you, you do this class and then you go back and say, well, you don't sit, you graduate from Caltech. You say, well, you know what, I'm going to start a And I have this idea about this really cool chip I can make that I can sell for a good amount of money and nobody has made it and I can make a lot of money. I mean, a lot of people have made a lot of money at that way. So, how do you do it? Well, you have to look at what your design is trying to design. Let's say, for the sake of argument, let's pick an example. Just, just throw out an example you, one of you guys. And let's go ahead and analyze it. DSPs? DSPs. DSP core, you mean? For, okay, well, let's try with that. Let's start with that. Well, there's a lot of competition in there, so that's I actually, uh, you have to take that into account. But let's say, let's, let's start with that and then we'll pick another example. So, let's say you want to, let's be a little more specific. What kind of DSP? For what? To do what? Hey, maybe something that talks on the graphics card. Right, okay, so you, you have a new idea, let's say, about 
uh, something that can do things faster on the graphic card so that people can better you know, have you know better games. Right? <coughs> yeah, absolutely. No, it's fine. I mean, you have the most sophisticated computers uh, nowadays in the game, and, and they have been like that for about the last 15 years. The fastest interfaces are on the game. But anyway, so let's let's start with that, and then say, well, I have, it just has to be relatively fast, right? So I have to start with something. Say, so, well, you know. My product it will take probably at least me, uh, it takes me about a year and a half, a year, a year and a half to develop this product. By the time it comes out, it will be two years from now, or a year and a half from now. And since I don't want to spend several billion dollars on making a foundry, I'm going to go fabulous, which is the model that a lot of semiconductors have, even very big ones. And the model is that there's a foundry somewhere else. It could be in upstate New York, it could be somewhere down in uh, Taiwan or China or Israel or somewhere, right? And then you basically say, uh, they send you the exact definition of the process. Basically, they give you design rules. So you know how the transistors are, what the rules of designing transistors, what the rules of the layout are. And then you go and make your design in that, simulate it in your simulator, complete your design, and ship them the layout electronically. That's called the tape out process. Gets there, they start processing the chip. What they do, they make the chips for you. They send them back to you. Now, so nowadays, actually, you can, they can even actually there's a packaging house next to it, and they package it and ship it right there to the customer. So it, it never enters your company, actually, except for a few samples of tests. So that can happen. So let's say we are doing that, and let's say we are looking two years down in the, uh, in the future, right? So probably you want to be either in 99 or 65 nanometer technology for a DSP because it has to be fast and it's a digital circuit mostly, and you want to have that. So let's say you want to, and again, that's a tricky example because it, there's a lot of effort involved. But let's, let's think. Let's continue. Now, you estimate the size of your chip. So, well, you know, like my technique allows me to do uh, these kind of things, and it takes this many transistors. So, the area of my chip is probably about, uh, you know, let's say, for the sake of argument, uh, 50 square, uh, square meters. And then you say, all right. So now you have to do a calculation. You have to find out how how much will you be uh, selling these chips, and how many two years now. Right. So you have to find it. So let's say, let's let, let before picking it on any number, let's see what that determines. Let me tell you some of the other parameters. To start the question, to so start a 90 nanometer process nowadays, so let's say you want to get a production run of the 90 nanometer chipset. So how much money do you need to do that? Well, you're not going to buy the family, right? So you're going fast. But when you're going fast, you have to buy the masks. You saw the masks, right? On the day before yesterday, Wednesday, right? That, that those are the things that are used to kind of make sure that they're, they project the image of each layer of the chip. So the mask set for 90 nanometer chip set, says the chip, today is close to a million dollars, probably about eight hundred thousand dollars. Let's say ballpark of one million. Okay? And that's assuming that you will hit it in one run. In one run. Right? So the first thing that comes back is correct. But there's a solution to avoid that problem. <coughs> the solution is that there are these shuttle runs. In other words, like the wafer you're looking at, you can think about a situation where not, not the whole wafer is made out of one design. So different people share the same big mass. The mass can be actually quite, the reticle can be quite large. But now they can split it between, let's say, 16 people, four by four matrix, and give you one of the four. And you can do your try your design in that one fourth, one quarter, and they give you a few chips, something like 50 or 100, and then you can test it. Once you get it right, then you go to the production mass set, which contains Nothing but your design. So that's going to cost some money, additional money, right? So let's say that shuttle runs, you need your, you want two shuttle runs, and each one of them probably will cost you about 150K. And then you have to think about how much time and money you have to spend basically on the engineering effort. I mean, you picked a tricky example, DSD, because it's kind of, there's a lot of engineering effort involved. So you have to take that into account. And again, there are ways of doing that. I don't want to go too deep into that. So let, let's just throw out a number. So you're running at, so let's say how many how many people would you, do you think would, you would need? Just let's take your estimate. So, for a DSP core design? Yeah, that's what you suggested, right? Right, right. right. Uh, I would imagine at least 40. 40 engineers. 40 engineers. Okay. Probably for like two. So for a startup company for with 40 people, all part, you need your burn rate, which includes all this money that you have to pay, the salary, the rent you have to pay, all sorts of other things, you know, other administrative fees, you have to get these people to, you know, get the secretary, you need all sorts of other things. So, your burn rate for a company of 40 probably with, uh, would be in the range 
talk about economics, right? Let's talk about it. This is, I think this is important. As important as the other things we're doing. Let's talk about it. The engineer salary for this kind of thing, probably when you get a reasonable engineer in the kind of the, it's definitely in the six figures. Low six figures, but six figures. Uh, in that range, right? And then you have to pay taxes. You have to pay for the benefits. You have to get the health insurance, otherwise they will go to your competitor. You have to pay for the rent. You have some people. Stock options. No, well, you don't pay for the stock options. You give them stock options, they can exercise this. And that you incentivize them. So, but the ballpark, 500, 600K, right? But that, that's, that's correct, that's right, that's right. There's, there are a lot of other expenditures. Actually, what I did, so 500 is probably closer because I, in, in that burn rate, I was thinking about several runs too, so let's drop that out. So, so basically, about 500K per month. And you need them for, what did you say, two years? Let's say three years. Optimistically? <laughs> three four months. Years. So that's $12 million there. I mean, I, I told, I mean, the reason I told you that, that you picked a kind of tricky example is this. This is one that's going to kill you. And, and it, there are some lessons to be learned from this. Let's talk about it. We will talk about it. And let's say this is 300K. This is just about peanuts like that compared to that. And this is about 1 mil. And so let's say you're looking at something like ballpark, say so it's about 13 something, let's say 14 mil. So you're spending $14 million just to get this developed. Right? The minimum, I mean, we and made some assumptions, some kind of really simplistic and optimistic assumptions to be fair. We can develop this in two years and start selling in two years. This production mass set the first one gets you there. You don't, you don't have any like, long term reliability issues and all those things. You need only two shelf runs and, and all sorts of things. But let's, let's just stick with these numbers. This is optimistic, this is very optimistic. Okay? But, so now, you want to make money on this. How many of these chips do you think you can sell? Let's 
you order one lot. Twelve wafers. It's going to cost you one million plus twelve times P. Very kind of roughly speaking. It's a little bit more sophisticated. The cost model is a little bit more sophisticated than that, but let's talk about that at that level. Uh, but yes, yeah, per wafer for the processing and the materials. The material is not that expensive. The, 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 the unprocessed wafer is not that expensive. Uh, for silicon.
right? And probably you won't get the money from the you won't start building volume, right? Immediately on the first the first one you sell, you don't you start you don't want to start on the first day the chips come out of the foundry 10 million units, right? They probably take a couple thousand to try several yeah, you have to apply some sort of appreciation. Well yeah you have to do all sorts of stuff and there are people again who we can have you can take an entire well let's say you can have a degree in this stuff. You can get a degree in this stuff I'm sure. But the thing is, I'm not going to get that deep. I mean, you can, you can, kind of, there are so many other parameters that you're pointing out. These are all valid things to think about. But I'm trying to keep the first order thing here. So this is the amount of money you will make if this is time here. Over time, of course. But now the other thing that to keep in mind is that once you go to production with such volumes, you can't keep your for, your 40 engineers. There are design mostly design engineers, but you have a couple of test engineers. Right? But when you go to production, you need a completely new batch of engineers who have been trained in a different discipline. It's a completely different discipline. You have to have production people. So you have to hire another probably 100 people to just support this. And I'm not exaggerating at all. And this is a very small operation, 150 people, for $70 million of, of sales. So this is actually a good margin. You know, you know where the flaw in these assumptions are? Is this, because you can sell it for that much. But let's go forward. You said that I want to kind of take your scenario, move forward. Uh, okay. But, but just let's move it. The, the number, this number is actually smaller, and hence this number is generally smaller. I'm not saying that it's always, if you have to find, if you find something like this, you should go for it. Now, but, they, but still, you have to remember, this means an initial investment of how much? Before you can start selling. Around 20. Twenty twenty-five, right? Because you need the fourteen mil to get there. But then you have to also support this activity before it starts making you money. So the first few thousands of wafers that you make are not making you money yet. Right? So you need probably twenty twenty-five million dollars just for this to start. So what's the solution? Go to Vegas. <laughs> okay, well, start with 100 bucks, put it on bread and uh, flag, and then uh, play probably 1,000 times and hope that not a single time you lose money, and then also assume that there's no cap on the amount of uh, money you can bet, and they don't throw you out. Against no, they won't throw, throw you out. Yeah. I guess you will lose your money. This we always outsource. What do you mean outsource? You outsource what? <laughs> there's nothing to outsource here yet. Find a venture camels. And, exactly. Investors, you need money. Venture capitalists is a good example for this kind. Actually, this number falls right in their ballpark. <coughs> Choose a different format. Hmm? Choose a different That's product. another way. That's another way to. We will talk about a different product in a minute. I mean, by the way, is this interesting to you? I mean, just let the, okay, because we, I can go on and on and on and on for the rest of the quarter. But I think this is important for you guys to understand. Right? So let's talk about this a little bit more. Just uh, we'll pick up a couple other examples. And we'll go and try to analyze the first order. Because this is important. I mean, you have to know why you're doing this stuff. And if it's important or not. But so if you go to venture capitalists, how many what how much money would you ask them? Thirty. Hmm? Thirty. Thirty, okay. Well, so that, that's a good idea. So, so you need you think probably you need thirty, right? So you go to a venture capitalist, so I'm a venture capitalist, you come to me. I've dealt with a lot of venture capitalists, so I, I know how they get. So I'm trying to simulate emulate for you uh, a venture capitalist in a nutshell. I want $30 million. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what do you have? A great product. A great product. So you show me all the stuff. So, um, I'm not sure you can sell it for $40 million, $40 dollars, first of all. I think you, can, you won't be able to sell it even for seven months. It depends on how, good, how bad a venture capitalist I am to say something like that. But, so, basically I will challenge a lot of your assumptions. I'll come back and with this whole bunch of new assumptions. I go through these numbers and change some of these numbers. I know this is not like that, this is not okay. And then come back and this, make this number five million dollars. Before <laughs> and so, no, this is not. Why should I pay you know, 30 million dollars to for something that makes me five million dollars? Options. Give up. Yeah. You shouldn't. Yeah. Well, if you don't think you're wrong. There are people who say, no matter what happens, I'm going to continue like this, on this path. No it's matter what the I mean, entire so world tells me, I mean, I have to continue it up. If you work so hard to get all of these numbers, you have to be sure of yourself. You can't just like. Well, you can never be certain. You can, you, 
know no, all there's, there's no one knows everything, right? There's a degree of like yeah, you can go wrong, but still, but to, to do all of that hard work and just go to someone and they say no, and you just say okay, I'll do something else. That really, I mean, I wouldn't do that. No, okay, so so this is a good point. No, it's a good point. So if you are confident in what you are proposing, you should you should ch challenge that. So you should be have something. So yes, well no, no, you have to do your homework. You say well, come up with. Four other examples of similar products or something that hasn't done past. Well, this is what it, what it sells now, for now, and what I'm offering is this, which has these other features, which this does not. And that's why I have a competitive advantage. And then that's the next question you're going to ask. You say, well, what is going to stop a big company like Intel or you know AMD or some someone else to come and that have a lot that has a lot more resources and a lot more money to come and do the same thing with better and faster than you? You need to get paid. Hmm? You need to get paid. Well, yeah, but just at, at the same time, still, I mean, you have to have a competitive advantage. Yeah? In other words, the, the word they sometimes use is, is an unfair advantage. You have, seriously, you have to have an unfair advantage. You, an unfair advantage could be a technology you developed, a technique you came up with, that, uh, and you file a patent on it or something, that allows you to do this better than the others, fundamentally better. Or you have a team, somehow assemble the team, that has so much experience with this that can turn it around in much lower, much shorter time. Or both. Or a lot of other things. So you have to have something that works to your advantage. And that's why it's, it's important to get the technical part right. Because it's only eventually through the technical part that you will have fundamental unfair advantage. Either the technical part or you identify a completely new market. Something that nobody has thought about. And execute to it like crazy. And you are there before everyone else. So you are six months, nine months ahead of everyone else and you make your money in the six to nine months. And then, what do you do with that money? So you go to uh, Caribbean, a wine island or something like that? No. You, you put it, you have to think about your next products. And you have to expand it to three more products. Quickly. That's the way capitalism works, right? So you have to constantly come up with new ideas, better ways of doing things. You know, the cliche. A better mousetrap. You have to make a better mousetrap to be able to. Unless you have a better mousetrap. That's, you know, they, Oh, uh, you will hear it if you go to VCs. <laughs> that and a lot more. But, okay, so in your, let's go back to your example. In your example, you're talking about $30 million. So you came to me asking $30 million. Well, I said, well, tell you what. I give you, instead of $30 million, I give you, I think, you know, I've looked at your idea and I had some, some of my technical due diligence people go look at it. I actually do some, some of this work myself. I mean, every so often, a lot of one of the VCs comes to me and says, can you look at this? Can you look at that? And tell me if this is kind of sound from technical. But there are tech, most of them are not technical people, VCs. So they send me kind of a look at it and try to poke hole in this stuff and sometimes it's junk. Sometimes there's something, something some, most of the time there's something there but it's not as, more, as valuable as they say it is. And things like that. So they send someone like me to you. They say, well, okay, show me your stuff. And then you sign, me an, sign, an, sign an NDA with me, non-disclosure agreement with me, and it comes to look at your stuff. So, well, okay, how about this, how about that, how about that, how about that? Right, I tried to poke hole in your ideas. And at the end of this, well, you know, it probably is going to work. They have to address this and this and this, but they, I think the basic model is sound. So, I'll take people that do But, um, so, then, then they say, okay, well, now I've talked to my technical people and they think it's, it's maybe a good idea. So, tell you what, I'll give you $5 million and I'll take... 50% of your company, and uh, I'm not making these numbers up, I mean, these are right ball, I mean, maybe $8 million or $8 million or 40% of your company, I mean, in stocks, right? The way they give you $8 million or $4 million is that they buy stocks at a certain price from you. And you have a certain number of stocks already, so basically it creates a breakdown of ownership. So I would say, and for the first year, until you get to these milestones, and then you, you, once you get to the milestones, uh, you, you go and raise another round of money. So what they do, basically, let's say they give you, they say, well, I think the value of this company is $10 billion assets, this idea, right? So they say the pre-money valuation, <coughs> and I'm willing to give you, let's say, 10. Let's change the number a little bit, make them round. So, or 8. Say, so I give you 8 for the first year. I want 10. Well, okay, if you want 10, then you have to give me 50% of your company as opposed to 40% of your company. 45, you got a deal. Okay, all right. <laughs> you, want to, you can't negotiate like that. Because <laughs> yeah, the way they negotiate with you is that, that at some point, if, you are, if, if they like your idea, they say, I think it's good. 
they give you a document which is about this thick. It's called the term sheet. And it expires the day, the day after you receive it, the following day, at 8 a.m. So you either sign it or don't. And usually you shouldn't, the first one try. Because if they really like it, they, they, won't, they, won't, they won't go away. But they try to make you think that, oh, this is the only opportunity. And it's not really cool. But uh, there's a lot of ga gamesmanship there, but for, let's not talk about that. Have you ever done the first day? Hmm? Have you ever done the first day? Uh, mm, almost. <laughs> I, I, I have one case where a couple of my former students started a company. And they, they got a term sheet. And they, they hadn't even signed it, so the guy, a couple of days later, they hadn't even told him, it, it hadn't even expired yet. So the next day, the guy sent an email and said, well, we retract this term sheet. So they changed their mind. It was a good thing, because they later got much better term sheets than those. But, uh, and they have a company that's ongoing for, has been ongoing for more than four years now. But, um, so, uh, but the thing is, so you, but you have two choices. You say, well, I can't do it with 10. I need 30. Well, if you want 30, I will give you 30. But you only own a quarter of your company. You like to do that. Because you might, you might not have a choice. If you don't get money from them, how else? Well, no, but think about it this way. If I get 10, if I take 10, and show a lot of progress in one year, then I can go to investors again, another set of investors, and say, well, this is the company as is. And they say, well, the pre-money valuation of this company is now, the, the valuation of this company before we give you money is about 30. You've built $10 million in value from their perspective. And if they give you the remaining 20, it will be at a much, it will take up a smaller fraction of your company. Right? So the way you break it up, you can get it all in one shot, you can break it up into multiple steps. Of course, there's a risk, because if you don't make enough progress as much as you had to, by that time, then you may lose your valuation, you may even get a down round, but that's what they call So the post money valuation will be smaller than what it was initially, or it could be a flat round. So this is called Series A, Series B, Series C, blah, blah. Okay? Yes? So I mean, it's better to be a venture capitalist than a venture capitalist. It's good to be the king, if that's the question. <laughs>
you and I start and then you say, well, we have to go raise money. Where do we go? We have to find big investments. So we go to Bank of America. So well, Bank of America, this is our track record. We started this, you know, companies and we are very good uh, entrepreneurs and art forte is <coughs> semiconductors and we have we are unfair advantage over other venture capitalists is that we can we have this technical background and blah blah and we've done this and we go and raise money and they say well no thank you then we go to Harvard <laughs> and then we go to Harvard and say well okay Harvard you have a big endowment and they invest in that endowment in a lot of things including venture capital that's part of an investment and or Caltech you go to Caltech so Caltech you know uh, we would like to raise some money. And say, well, okay, well, this is interesting, and we all we get to, they look at our credentials and all those things, and they give us something. So eventually, we manage to find three or four investors in our venture capital. Those are called LPs, or limited partners. Let's say one is Caltech, one is Harvard, one is I don't know Washington Mutual, blah blah. Okay, and then we we raise a fund. So we raise a three hundred million dollar fund.
maintain their ownership in terms of percentages. So if let's say I'm a VC, I, Series A, I've invested money in your company, and usually it's not just one VC, usually there are two or three of them that syndicate and have a team together. But um, I've invested, let's say me, as one of the VCs, have invested enough money, 20%, I own 20% stock of your company, right? And your post money value, after, so I get, so we gave you $10 million pre, so on 10 million, so the post money is 20 million. So we are saying that at this point in time, the company is worth $20 million in our mind. It's kind of a, uh, a little bit of a fictitious value, but so now, after a year, you've done a great job, so now the company's post-money valuation is $40 million. So somebody else is willing to invest money at pre-series B of $40 million. And they invest $20 million. So that means that my share has been reduced by 60%, 66%, right? It's about two-thirds of what it was, because it's now 40 to 20. So now, if I just don't invest any additional money, my ownership from 20% goes to something like 13% or something, right? But I have the option, no, almost always the investors have the option of coming back and buying shares at the new price. Which is, now, if it was $1 per share before, now it's $2 per share because that doubled, right? To maintain my ownership, the 20%. What they can do is just can, they can back out of that. So we are not giving pro, pro rat. And that's why they raised a lot more money. So to be able to invest in something like 10, $5 million Series A companies, which on the surface sounds like $50 million, I have to have at least something like 200, 300 million dollars as a VC because I need to be able to pay the pro rata for subsequent rounds. Otherwise, my ownership will start shrinking and my return on investment will shrink. And that's how the that employees' share starts becoming smaller and smaller. I mean, they don't found as well. But, so let's go back to example. We're going to digress and going to VC and investment kind of thing. And I will be happy to talk to you about this stuff later on if you are offline. But, uh, so let's talk about this example. I want to kind of draw a conclusion from here. So what it, one thing we saw is that the initial investments, although it appears large, it's quite small with the total amount I would pay if I have a successful product, which means that I'm making a lot, right? And in principle, it could be quite profitable. But I have to be aware of that. And this number is becoming larger and larger as the process has become small, I mean, the feature size has become smaller and smaller. But now let's pick another example. So what you pick is a DSP. Let me pick another example. Let's say you come up with, let's say you come up with this very cute topology, very a, a great idea for making a very high frequency broadband amplifier. Okay? And you want to go and make a company based on it. And you file several patents, and it's very, very it's a great idea. It gives you a very broadband amplifier for something, right? So let's say you find you try to find a customer. You try you find a customer, someone is maybe very, very interested, right? So let's let's say for the sake of argument, this is the military, right? This time is interested in buying a lot of these amplifiers because they can put it in some sort of gadget, right? And it's a broad broadband amplifier, you, nobody can make it, and you can make it much cheaper than everyone else. So the companies that are there make are make selling them each for five hundred dollars. And you say, I can make these for five bucks or three bucks. Because this is an integrated in large volume. Because the area of an amplifier will not be that large, it will be kind of, let's say, three millimeters square. Right? Now, is that economical? Well, I don't know yet. But the first question I ask you is that, how many do you think you can sell? If you're going to sell 100, then this analysis completely changes, right? Then this part of this discussion, the wafer price, does not matter at all. It's all this. If this can be amortized over 100 units, how much will it cost? If just to look at that, that's $10,000 per unit, right? So it doesn't make sense to make that in a 90 nanometer process, but you may be able to do it in a different kind of process, in a cheaper process. Let's say a 0.35 micron process. And if you can do it, then you have to look back at your model and analysis. But then the other interesting thing is that that process, instead of requiring $1 million upfront investment, may need only 200 k upfront. And then you may be able, since this is not as big a chip, you may need a lot few, uh, kind of much smaller number of people, right? So you may be able to get away with five people. And then the initial investment, instead of being something like $30 million, maybe just a million dollars or two. Then you still go to VCs. 
but you could. But if you do, you will lose control of something that you could have maintained control over yourself and ownership. So you have to find another kind of investment for that. There are other kinds of investment. There are so-called angels, for instance. Angels are kind of wealthy individuals, mostly, who want to uh, invest in things and presumably get some money back. So they come and give you a smaller chunk of money and you can get some return on that. But do business angels not take a percentage in your business as well? They do take a percentage out of your business, but the, the kind of percentages that they take are much more reasonable. Because it doesn't make, see, think about the VCs. Actually, most VCs won't even invest in something like that. The reason is that VCs have to spend a lot of time micromanaging, for better or for worse, your business when they invest in it, right? So their time is the bottleneck. So they want to invest in a smaller number of better, bigger opportunities. And they want to look for things that have the upside potential as big as possible. Because they want to find those that will, the one will pay for the remaining nine that have failed. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for VCs to come and invest in 100 of these. But there's a certain kind of investment, like the one that, actually the, 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 the example you started fits the VC model. And that's why I started talking about VCs. The kind of small chip may not, depending on how it is. May or may not. And, but all of it goes back to the fact that there's this initial upfront cost. cost. There's this constant cost. There's this payment for engineers and design time takes. You have to spend money on that, and a lot of it. And you have to remember, every week you lose. Let's say you, you were supposed to do something by such and such day, and you lost a week. That costs you something like more than hundred thousand dollars. So time is really money, right? In a sense. Now, I'm just kind of. It was kind of. I feel a little bit strange about this last hour because it was something like I gave you kind of points out of the space of all of these things. So this is not the whole story by any means. These were just kind of like snapshots of things randomly from different perspectives. But I want you to be aware of this thing. And we'll talk about it later on throughout the course that it has to make economic sense for what you do. Eventually it has to, even if you're working on theory, eventually it has to make economic sense. Because that theory has to enable some practical thing to be better, and that practical thing has to enable something to be cheaper and better, faster, and make money. In other words, more accurately, instead of saying you make money, add value. They're not equivalent. Alright, any questions about this before we take a break and then come back for the uh, real stuff? I'm sorry, I, I, I thought you, you, you might to hear this, but just, uh, And if you have questions about this, I will say feel free to come talk to me afterwards, but uh, maybe not today, but uh, other days. But uh, just, uh, so <coughs> any questions? Any other thoughts, comments, observations? I'd like to start my first because it's a garage. <laughs> That's the best way to start. <laughs> That's actually the best way to start. See, because once you have full control over it, you have, you can make a lot of mistakes, no doubt about it, and you have to try to learn as much as you can from other people's experience. But start, starting small allows you to grow and make mistakes at the time where they're not fatal. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't start a VC-based company. If you have the opportunity, go for it. But I'm saying that you have, then you're more prone to fatal mistakes, and your mistakes will have a larger impact on your business. And the other thing is that the question you ask, nobody gets bankrupt. Because of this, unless you kind of get a loan against your house, kind of borrow against your house or something like that, and then kind of borrow a lot of money on your credit card to fund your company, which is actually an interesting thing, which is the riskiest thing, but also has it has the most reward because you have one hundred percent ownership in your business. Yes. So I'm just wondering if you actually go out and try to do this and fail, it's like like the next idea that you have to try again or VCs. Less likely. Oh, that's an excellent question. Is it going to be harder? As counterintuitive as it may sound, it's exactly the opposite. Because you have experience. Yes. Okay. Well. Interestingly, interestingly, actually, you know, historically, if you look at the statistics, uh, it's people's third company that's the most successful. For successful entrepreneurs. And this is the, the trend. The first company is a kind of a an okay, I mean, kind of a reasonable success. Usually, it's some sort of exit, they sell it for a certain amount of money and all those things, it doesn't go public, but they make some money, right? The first company, because they're dedicated, they're naive, 
they are they go and first startup is a triumph of hope over uh, realism or ignorance or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> okay. By the second time, they're complacent and they got like see, they are a little smug. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I know everything about this business, and I, I, I'm not going to repeat the mistakes of last time. It's going to be even more successful than, than last time. So by that, that time they bought the Ferrari and they kind of are running around and they're not spending the time, they're not focusing. The second one is always always a failure. <laughs> after the first success, not, not, not the second. The one right after the first success. And then by that time, they've probably gone through the overvaluation and underestimation, so cycle. So they got over overshot and undershot. And kind of, so now they're kind of ready to kind of be realistic. And usually the third one is the one that goes public and becomes a big company. If you look at the big companies, most of them are a third company. The founders did. Yes. Is it better to have fifty one percent control of a company or have like I borrow a lot of money from like other people and give them the rest forty nine percent or have hundred percent? See, there is no uh, it's not as black and white. The fifty percent is there's no magical thing to fifty percent. Right? For instance, let me give you because you know the, I told you term sheet is a bad mistake. The closing documents and once you start to sign the term sheet, it takes a couple more months to actually get the money, and then there's closing documents that are this thick. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. It's about this thick. And you need a kind of an army of lawyers to go through them. Right? And just basically in those terms, it's all the essential terms. There are certain terms that, for instance, in terms of change of ownership, it's the majority of the, uh, what they call the uh, preferred stockholders. Who are the investors? So there are common stockholders that prefer. They have a preference. So even in 50%, they have a lot of control. Even in 49%, they have a lot of control over your company. Because most of the stock that you have on your side, a lot of it's options that you have given your employees. Stock options until exercise are not real options, or are not real stocks. So they don't count in votes. There are a lot of They've been doing this for more than a hundred years in this setting. And this kind of investment has been going on for thousands of years, right, in general, uh, investing. They have perfected the level. That, I'm, not, I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just trying to tell you that don't be under, don't have the illusion that if you have 51% of your company ownership, you have a lot of control. You have some control. Because you are, the, the control you have is that you're valuable to them because you are a person who can do that chip, the DSP chip for cheaper and better What's than anyone else. <coughs> That's the control you have. It's not a kind of a legal, it's not a litigious control or legal control. I mean, you have some of that, but it's not as big as you think. 